Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, the Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar that is hosted by Granted, which is a joint project of Jewish Funders Network and Upstart. Granted works to strengthen relationships between grant makers and grant seekers in the Jewish community through webinars like this, small facilitated conversations, and our resource hub. I would like to encourage all of you to check out our resource hub, jgranted.org, after today's program. And the tool that we're gonna be discussing today will actually be on that hub as well for you to, to see. Today's topic is on sustainability diagnostic tools, a new way to collaboratively measure impact. And I am now happy to introduce our moderator for today's program, my colleague, Wayne Green, the executive director at Honeycomb to further frame the program and introduce his fellow speakers. Thank you so much, Wayne. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, thank you, everyone who is joining us on this call. I have seen the uh, the list of attendees, and I know there are lots of friends and partners that uh, we know uh, and appreciate the work. So we're glad that you are part of the conversation with us today. Um, and I'm really excited that I uh, am able to moderate this with um, three incredible women who are doing fantastic work out in the field. Um, so I just want to do a quick introduction of each of the speakers and then really get into a little bit about what uh, this diagnostic tool is uh, and then uh, move it along. So um, first introduction is to uh, Sarah Allen, Executive Director and Associate Vice President, Community and Jewish Life at JFNA. Um, Sarah is a wonderful partner, friend and dedicated to care for best opportunities made available to teens and has worked with 10 communities in the Funder Collaborative and has made incredible tools, research and opportunities to be extended out to the larger field. And I'm really excited um, that Sarah Sarah is here today to share about the sustainability diagnostic tool. Um, also with us today is Rebecca Weinstock, who's the Director of Partnerships and Grants at the Associated, um, the Jewish Federations of Baltimore, um, and she's responsible for growing and deepening the Foundation's partnerships and overseas research and evaluation initiatives at the Associate and its agencies. Um, and lastly, who you'll also hear from today is Sam Khan strakes who's at Forefront uh, Baltimore um, and is the co-managing senior director. And in previous role, um, Sam led philanthropy programs fund and oversaw many of the signature programs as well as community partnerships. I'm really excited that um, I am had been asked to participate today because a number of the programs actually relate to some of the youth philanthropy work that I get to do with Honeycomb. Um, so a little bit about um, what we're gonna be talking about today, this sustainability diagnostic tool. As we are aware, it is really important to monitor and provide feedback on developments in the structural and operational aspects of initiatives. And from a high level vantage point, this diagnostic tool is really aimed to enable communities initially from the funder collaborative and beyond to assess their own progress towards various dimensions of sustainability. What is really exciting for us today, I think, is to understand more about this tool and to go in depth with it being operationalized with our partners in Baltimore, who we'll hear from a little bit more on the call. What I really like about this tool is that it's very detailed and provides scope for self-administration with local leaders and champions, or having the opportunity to employ external support or consultants. In learning about this tool, its domains and its indicators, it gives a very clear strategy of what one is able to um, assess in understanding sustainability for programs. And one final piece that I just want to add is that I'm really proud, even though I didn't create this tool, um, but I'm really proud that this tool was created with the audience and understanding of teen engagement, an area that I'm really passionate in and believe has important value to our overall Jewish community and to peoplehood around the country and internationally. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Sarah to kick us off. Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for such a warm welcome, and we're really grateful to be here. Um, I have a very brief slideshow. Um, if we could just show that, it'll just help us as we walk through um, all of the pieces that we're going to be talking about today. So as Wayne shared, I am the Executive Director of the Jewish Teen Education and Engagement Funder Collaborative. As you can see here, we are now powered by JFNA so that we have much more national reach. But all of this work was really born out of 10 communities who are working together to really reimagine what Jewish life and meaningful Jewish teen education and engagement could look like through a series of experiments and uh, new ways of thinking, and also really think about strengthening 
the entire ecosystem and how that supports all of these new models. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I can show a little bit about what this looks like. What do we mean by building an ecosystem and how do we work together across 10 communities? So early on, we really developed um, what we call our shared frameworks. And these were the six measures of success that unite all of this work. Um, this work is all funded locally through local funders and it's in partnership with Jim Joseph Foundation. So it's really casts a wide net of diversity of you know, nuances in different communities. And yet these were sort of the six aspirational aims that we were all moving towards. Um, and it's really important to note here that this was really came from the group itself. Um, one of the things I'm always struck by is how three of the measures are on teens themselves, and the other three are really about the ecosystem and the infrastructure that's needed to do this kind of work. Each of these measures um, has their own surveys and tools that we also make publicly available. Um, just in the hopes of really uniting the field around a common language. Um, and I'll walk you through them briefly, and we're going to spend most of our time today on four and five. So the first three are, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about um, really reimagining Jewish life with teens? And so part of our goals were we really wanted to increase the numbers of teens that we were engaging and also focus on the diversity of those teens. And at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we were having a Jewish impact on those teens. So the first three rolled up into what we call our teen survey. This was all developed in partnership with Rosoff Consulting. Um, and if you're familiar with the Gen Z Now report from the Jewish Education Project, that's really built on the survey, which we've had in the field for five years. So we get a very great national snapshot. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead to six, which is really thinking about how is it that we can achieve these goals and what a vital role youth professionals play in some of this work. So we have an entire measure and survey focused on really um, making sure that youth professionals have the competencies, the confidence and the support that they need to uh, really help achieve these goals. And four and five are really what we talk about when we think about sustainability. And these two, we um, are grouping them together as we created our diagnostic. Um, one of the important evolutions of this tool was really thinking about um, sustainability in the sense of the change we are aiming to see in the communities, far beyond just creating financial models and thinking about program funding. So that was really a big shift in the culture. Um, and you know, really tied to that is how do we sort of make sure that teens and their voices are continually prioritized in the community. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. What we developed was really a framework for sustainability. And so really the shared language was really vital to talking about how we might measure our own progress along this route. So when we talk about sustainability, there was a big shift moving beyond thinking about the funding of programs and thinking instead about how can we really capture um, a community's ability to prioritize teen engagement, and what are the different dimensions that we really want to see happen that might indicate that this was really um, moving along a spectrum. So as we think about sustainability, it's really focused on the quality of teen offerings, the diversity of teen offerings, um, and as we said, you know, focusing on the professional's development so that there really is a cadre of well-trained and valued professionals out there. And if you please go to my next and last slide. Um, all of our tools, as I said, are, are publicly available. We have guidebooks for usage, and we'll talk a little bit more about the implementation um, as we move into this call. Um, but I wanted to give you a glimpse of what we're talking about as we think about the, do the domains around sustainability. So um, this really was an iterative process with Rosoff Consulting, very much in line with how most of our tools have been developed, because as the work expanded on the field, we were getting a better understanding of how these pieces all work together. Um, and there's lots of flexibility for the communities um, to really think about how they might prioritize some of these things. But what became incredibly clear um, was these domains 
were universal across the communities. So we started with a validated tool that's actually um, had been in the public health field for quite some time and really sought to adapt this for our work on the ground. Um, each of these indicators uh, have, of these domains have three to four indicators within them, which there will be a link to the full, full tool so you can see them. But in very broad strokes, we know how critical leadership is and the stability of these champions in the field. So really um, wanting to capture different pieces of the leadership. Um, as you think about community change, a clear mission and change theory was really vital to helping all of our partners in this work from grantees to youth professionals to funders really feel aligned with the change that was happening on the ground. Um, the financial future for sure plays a role in some of this, but you'll see it's one of eight. Um, and really thinking about how you diversify besides uh, individual grants and perhaps individual donors into potential for earned income, um, which is also tied to the demand for service. Are programs at capacity? Are we asking for new models? Really, are we sort of changing the culture around um, how teens are thinking about engaging with some of the offerings? And do teens play a role in some of this work, right? We have learned how critical putting teens in the driver's seat is to, to uh, really effective engagement. So we wanted to be able to capture that piece. Um, the partnerships are critical as we think about decreasing redundancies and really fueling some really innovative collaborations. Um, and the next piece is what I had spoken about was uh, really thinking about how we might best support and grow our youth professionals who are really in the front lines of all of this work. And how do we help them have the tools to communicate all of the value that they're delivering. Um, and the last piece, which you know, we have all lived through the last two years of shifting sand and changing landscapes and really ensuring that initiatives are positioned to pivot and to experiment and to, uh, to change in the moment. And at the same time that some of these changes are really data informed. And so this last piece really sort of captures how is it that we're receiving information? Are we sharing um, the latest research around adolescent development? And are we aware of what's happening um, really in the broader community so that we can respond and grow. So with that, hopefully you get a little bit of a sense of what we think about as the Funder Collaborative talks about sustainability. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues in Baltimore to share about how they use this in their own initiative. Rebecca. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and I wanna just apologize um, at the, the start that I'm getting over a cold and so my voice is a little bit hoarse. Um, I also want to um, just note that I've been involved, um, as, as Wayne mentioned, I'm at the Federation in Baltimore, which is the local funding partner um, with Forefront Our Teen Initiative. Um, I've been involved um, basically since Forefront's inception six years ago, have had the privilege of working closely with Sarah um, and with Sam um, and uh, Sam's predecessor, um, Rabbi Dina Schaefer, who's now part of the Funder Collaborative. Um, and um, this opportunity to um, really experiment and pilot the sustainability diagnostic tool um, was, was extremely valuable for us, um, especially in terms of, of the timing um, in which it, it was done, which was um, basically the, the year prior to um, applying for our renewal grant, which we're now sort of in the final stages of. Um, so I wanted to just share some of the sort of thinking about um, doing the sustainability diagnostic tool ourselves versus using an external consultant and some of the background. Um, and really the, the thinking around the sustainability tool started in the summer of 2020. Um, it was in the first months of the pandemic and um, the financial implications of the pandemic were still unfolding. And we were thinking about shifts within our evaluation budget that would still allow us to accomplish our learning goals. Um, it also coincided with revisioning our lay leadership structure. We had always had lay leaders who were um, guiding us and providing advice in terms of our teen initiative. Um, but we had sort of had a hiatus from having a formal committee. And that fall, we 
relaunched an advisory committee. Um, we felt that the timing was really important in terms of the stage that we were at in our initiative. And in thinking about both how we might activate our lay leadership and widen their perspectives about Forefront, um, we thought that the potential of using this, this tool and, and of going through the process with our lay leaders as our partners could be incredibly valuable. Um, and I also just wanna give kudos and uh, appreciation to Sarah for encouraging us to do this on our own. It was a bit daunting at first and Sarah um, definitely um, encouraged and gave us guidance through the way, all along the way, um, as well as our program officer at the Jim Joseph Foundation. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of support for undertaking this ourselves and um, for allowing us to experiment. Um, and I think that the, the feedback all along was that there's no one right way to do this. And there wasn't an expectation of what the final product um, was going to be that we were going to get out of this and more, um, you know, to focus on the importance and the value of having conversations with our stakeholders and using the sustainability diagnostic tool in the domains to guide those conversations and to widen our understanding of where we were at in terms of having impact in the various domains. Um, I also want to note that we did think seriously about the potential drawbacks of doing it ourselves, both the bias um, that we bring to it and you know, the, an external evaluator consultant wouldn't necessarily have, um, hopefully wouldn't have at all, and also that the stakeholders would potentially be a little more guarded, um, potentially less forthcoming with criticism when they were talking to leadership of the initiative, um, but ultimately, ultimately felt that the, the pros outweighed the cons and both the, um, the value of hearing firsthand from our stakeholders. Um, and also I think our knowledge of the local landscape and our ability to put in context what we were hearing um, that a, an external evaluator might not necessarily um, have had. And we, we addressed some of the challenges. We were very transparent with everyone who we spoke to to um, reassure them about their own confidentiality and that we wouldn't be quoting anything directly in our final uh, report or summary. Um, and people, you know, we felt that they were open with us um, and that um, there they, you know, we were we heard both positive and um, areas where we could improve throughout the conversations that we had. So I'm gonna let Sam talk a little more specifically about how we actually um, developed a process and, and what that in, involved. Um, take it away, Sam. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and share um, a little bit about what this process was like for us in Baltimore. Um, so we we started with our full our full um, lay advisory committee and oh, sorry, um, started with our full advisory committee um, and we really talked through all of the domains that, that Sarah had shared previously on the slide. Uh, and we had prioritized four of them that we felt were important to us at Forefront and that we felt we could get the most information um, from our stakeholders. So we, um, sorry, someone's trying to reach me. Um, so we we prioritized four of them together as a, as a full committee. And then we, um, we moved forward with forming a subcommittee. So we, tapped four of our, our lay leaders to sort of be the ones to guide this process, um, to help us with the interviews, to help us um, really guide guide the whole thing and, and shape what the what the process looked like. So um, we had our, our lay leaders, our subcommittee formed, and we um, had some training with, with Sarah Allen and Frida from Rossoff Consultings. Um, they, they really helped us see that the conversation was the intervention. So looking at it that way really helped us see that whatever we got out of it, whatever we, we you know, we gleaned from these conversations would be helpful. Um, and the conversations were really, you know, impactful and I'm grateful to have been a part of them. Um, and I'll share more about, you know, how we implemented some of the feedback in a bit, but 
we also took the interview guide and we we revised it to make it a bit more conversational. Um, so we, you know, we're not professional evaluators and we knew our, our subcommittee and we knew for ourselves that we really wanted it to be, to feel more like a conversation than an interview. Um, so it was really lovely that we were able to make it relevant to our, you know, to our stakeholders to make it feel like it was conversational. Um, and that was a, a really nice piece, having that flexibility to, um, to revise it. We started with some initial conversations um, with two of our stakeholders that we felt like we could get some feedback about the process. We've never done anything like this before. So it was nice to be able to um, get some feedback, what worked, what didn't work. Um, did it feel like a conversation? Um, and, and going back to how we prioritize some of those domains, um, we asked the questions about those indicators up front. So we knew that those four were most important, most relevant to our work, and we um, sort of front loaded the conversation. So we knew that those, you know, would be, would definitely have the opportunity to have, to have been part of the conversation. Um, and, and the others, um, we felt like people wouldn't have as much to share about. So those were kind of towards the end of the conversation. Um, we conducted uh, a combination of individual and group interviews, which was really interesting. Some stakeholders, we felt like they, they would have enough and, and interesting things to say for, for us to have an individual conversation and some group conversations with groups of um, parents of teens, with groups of youth professionals in the community. Um, so eight conversations with a total of 22 participants. Um, our lay leaders facilitated the conversations. Rebecca and I were present on um, all of the conversations. There was always a staff presence, but um, our lay leaders took that heavy lift on and really did a phenomenal job um, asking and, and and probing and, and being the ones to lead those conversations. Um, and it was the height of the pandemic. So everything was done via Zoom, um, which made scheduling, you know, a bit easier. And I think people, you know, are more uh, apt to agree to some kind of conversation if it's if it's easy to just join virtually. So it was really an interesting process. And we'll share more um, about some of our takeaways and, and what worked and what didn't work for us in a little bit. So I think we'll pass it back to Wayne for now. And um... Great, thank you, Sam. Um, so I encourage um, everyone on the call to uh, put any questions um, through to us. We have had a couple and um, we've already got some that I'm really interested to ask um, Sarah, Sam and Rebecca. Um, and so first of all, I, I have um, just one reflection that uh, even though I'm familiar with the tool, you know, I think Sarah, you put up a slide there with the eight domains. And I think what's really powerful to see about those eight domains, and when we think about sustainability, often it is a real focus just on finances. And so I think this idea of exploring sustainability as sustaining and long and strong leadership and skilling up professionals and other components of this work is really um, important to really think about the holistic nature of what sustainability means for an organization. Um, and so my first question um, to you, Sarah, is, is just about you know why was it that it, a diagnostic tool was created instead of a survey to understand these pieces? Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a great question, and this was actually the subject of much discussion as we started thinking about how we might measure our progress around um, our measures four and five about uh, sustainability and and prioritizing um, teen engagement. Um, and what we realized was we wanted to get a sense of where we were. And what we really wanted to do was um, create a tool that would encourage the community to be in conversation with each other. And this is what Rebecca and Sam were really talking about, the value of the tool. Um, there isn't a right or wrong. There isn't necessarily an end point. What was really critical was providing a guided framework for some of these community conversations. Because what's so powerful about you know, the work that we're really engaged in is about culture shift and culture change. And to bring the community along in that process is um, as vital as some of the new programs and models that we're seeding. So um, thinking of it as a diagnostic that would invite conversation where people didn't necessarily feel like they were being measured um, was a really powerful statement. 
Um, and in the corresponding rubric, if you are able to open um, the tool and really see all of the indicators, um, we were even very sensitive to how we were providing guidance on how to analyze some of the information. And you'll notice that uh, you know you sort of have a, a color coded system, um, and you know there are numbers there, but most of the communities who've been using this have really um, just tried to think about sort of getting a sense of where they are in that rubric, and then creating an action plan to, to move down um, a path towards a more sustainable future, um, rather than thinking of it as very binary or black and white. Mm -hmm. Thanks. One of the other pieces that I'm curious just to hear from you, Sarah, too, is that, you know, this tool was designed with the, the Funded Collaborative and really for a teen audience. Um, and so how adaptable is it for other populations and the rest of the Jewish communal life? We're already hearing so much interest in thinking about how um, folks could adapt a tool like this to really um, put some language around sustainability, um, whether it's a program that they're funding or a different, more broader initiative. Um, I think sort of the main takeaways as you think about the adaptability of the tool um, is very similar to what Forefront discovered is um, really prioritizing what's of most value to the community um, and really using the tool to lead some of those conversations. Um, so the idea of thinking about sustainability of any initiative um, with some defined frameworks around it, um, I think lends itself to a lot of adaptability. Um, we made this tool public um, Aaron Sachs from Jim Joseph Foundation wrote a beautiful piece, which we'll link to um, in the chat as well, about sort of why, from the foundation's perspective, sustainability is so powerful and why this tool matters. Um, and with that, we released the tool. Um, and I will say within two or three days, we received 44 emails from organizations around the world. Um, and as much as we hope they use the tool, what it really did was open conversation um, and really help guide some internal conversations around um, prioritizing and planning for sustainability early on in an initiative or a program. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm also just going to give you an extra plug there, um, Sarah. I think one of the fantastic things that have really come out of the Funded Collaborative is that uh, this in initiative that was around the country has taken the skills and assets that have been created and, and made them open source, which I think is really important because not only is the, the SDT available, but there's so many other research um, surveys that are now made available more publicly. And I can certainly say from my perspective at Honeycomb, we actually used one of them and we're uh, this year going to be using a second and um, one of your surveys and so I think it's really great to have uh, such a large entity that has already standardized and, and explored the best ways for diagnostic tools and research to be offered to the wider audience and how some of us can really do that work and then have some comparative to what some of the national averages are so that's really fantastic. Um, I've got some questions for my colleagues from Baltimore which uh, I'm a big fan of uh, that city um, and so I'm curious just to hear um, from you, Rebecca and Sam, just to hear a little bit more about, you know, how did, you know, the relationship that you have between the forefront and the associated and, you know, what made you draw to use this as your, your method to kind of understand your programming and, and move forward with the work with the Funded Collaborative? Thanks, Wayne. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that um, partnership piece. So the, the associated in Baltimore has, um, really a strong, um, uh, puts a strong value on partnership with our agencies. We are still operating in this sort of historical federated model where we give our local um, agencies unrestricted allocations. And we are always in close communication and working in close partnership um, with our agencies. And I think that Forefront has been just sort of another example um, of the way that we are are working in in collaboration and and partnership and um, view ourselves less as uh, grantor grantee and and more as as partners in um, having impact and and accomplishing the work. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I worked closely um, with Sam's predecessor in this role and and over the last 
Sam, year plus that you've been in this role have worked um, closely with you were in regular communication. And I think that this actually in some ways, um, the opportunity to, to implement the sustainability diagnostic um, helped strengthen our relationship because we had to be in such um, close communication around both the um, coordination of just the logistics and then the um, how are we interpreting our findings and, and what are we doing with what we've learned. Um, so it just sort of opened up um, new conversations. Um, it deepened existing conversations um, and, and I think really strengthened our, our partnership. I don't know if Sam, you wanna add anything else? Yeah, I'll just, I'll echo, you know, your sentiment that I think if this was our, our first major project that we, that we got to work on you and I in partnership. And I think, um, like you said, it strengthened our working relationship, but everything that we really do is um, in partnership. And especially with this, the whole thing was in partnership from the beginning to the logistics to um, Rebecca and I were, were on the conversations to the train, like it, everything was, was in partnership. And I agree that um, I don't think it would have been as strong had we not been able to, to tap into each other's strengths. Um, this kind of dovetails to that question and also a little bit what you spoke about at the beginning, Rebecca, just in terms of this tool has the capability to be um, implemented and run internally versus getting an external consultant. And what was the rationale when you were looking at this to make that decision? Because I know we have a number of funders on this call, we have professionals, um, educators. So we'd be really interested to know like what was the rationale and what you know tipped the scales as to which side you would move ahead with using this tool. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that the timing of it was important for us. We were um, still facing some uncertainty in terms of um, the pandemic and, and how it was going to um, impact our budget. And, and there were additional things that we wanted to accomplish um, with the, the funds that we had set aside for our local evaluation. Um, so the opportunity to do it ourselves at, at that point in time felt like um, you know, if, if we have the capacity through the tools that have been created, um, then, then why not try it ourselves um, and leave some of the other pieces of the evaluation to external um, consultants. Um, but I will say that it was a significant time commitment, and that would definitely be a consideration for anyone who's thinking about doing it themselves versus bringing in um, a consultant that um, we were, as Sam mentioned, on all of the um, conversations and each conversation required preparation um, and it required debrief afterwards. Um, so it, it wasn't just the conversations, it was, it was mm -hmm. the, the pieces before and after um, that um, were quite time consuming. And then, um, you know, also having to synthesize um, and draw out the themes and the conclusions and um, the important, um, the pieces of our conversations that we felt were the important ones that we want to um, move forward on also required a significant amount of time. So I would just um, definitely consider that when um, mm -hmm. making a determination um, that there, you know, we had our lay leaders on board to, to support us in this. It also required them to make a commitment um, and we, we have thankfully had a very engaged, committed group of lay leaders who were willing um, to take the time, um, but that would also be a consideration. Mm -hmm. And I also, I wonder about um, the skill set of the professionals who are gonna be working on this, kind of understanding that they had the, the skill set to be able to use the tool effectively. Um, I know the tool is really robust and has a lot of information in it, but it, it also requires the, the skill set for the professionals, which obviously are internal to be able to administer. Yeah, I will say though that um, as Sam mentioned, Sarah and um, Greta Gonshore Cohen at um, Rossoff Consultants did an excellent training. Um, 
And we we had no expectations that our lay leaders came into this with any specific skill set. Um, I think it's an important consideration, um, but they were able to give us some guidance on how to effectively conduct interviews, um, how to think about our findings, um, which was helpful. And um, I, I think that um, probably the the more challenging piece is the the analysis and making meaning from the conversations. I just wanted to add to that, that the, the interview guide was very easy to use. You know, it, it told you exactly what questions you were meant to ask. Um, it had specific probes to follow up. And I think that made it easy for our lay leaders to sort of pick up and feel comfortable um, facilitating the conversation. We also were able to then go back and, and make it feel like um, it was more conversational. So that flexibility was really nice as well. Okay. Um, there are quite a few questions that have come through from um, the audience. So I'm going to ask them and then go back to some of the questions I have as well. But one of the questions we had, um, as I said, we have got funders on the call. And there's a question about, you know, what are your thoughts about the tool being used on the front end for funders to help with the criteria in selecting grants for funding? I love this question. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, the um, one is we are a big believer of using tools on the front end to really sort of think through next steps. Um, so um, one thing I just want to make clear is um, what we're talking about today is the sustainability diagnostic for the ecosystem that surrounds teen initiatives. Um, and that's really the very, very expansive view. Also in the link that was provided is what we call our program sustainability diagnostic tool, um, because you know, we sort of never intended to create it, um, but the benefit of a linked system is really seeing what bubbles up. And it was very, very clear as we developed the ecosystem level, um, sort of the funders around the table who are both um, our national funding partner, Jim Joseph Foundation, but also uh, a mix of federations and community foundations um, really looked up and said, we, we want a similar framework and playbook for having conversations with our grantee partners. Um, so there is an adapted version that is focused um, very squarely on the programs themselves. So anybody who might be receiving funding, um, you will see very uh, similar echoed themes. Um, there are some you know, tweaks to make it um, you know, more pared down for programs. Um, and San Francisco did an excellent pilot um, before their latest round of funding a couple of years ago, um, where they played that role with, um, with you know, potential grantee partners to really get a sense of uh, how folks were, might be prioritizing sustainability, thinking about it, probing the, um, some of the questions that they might have. Um, and it was very, very helpful for people who found themselves in a funding role um, to really be able to point to a more macro view and a standardized set of questions. So it is a great use of the tool. The, the program one um, is on grant ed and also happen, um, very happy to do a similar training uh, for anybody who might be interested in using it in that way. Great, thank you. And uh, I see Sarah has added her details into the chat box if you, anyone wants to reach out to her after this training. Um, I've, there's a, a question here and then I'm gonna go back to, I see there's some a question from a part, one of our partners in Israel, um, but how long was the process from start to finish? Rebecca, Sam, can you take that one? Yeah, I just put that in the chat. So we, we had our training in March of 2021 um, and we we finished conducting interviews in July of okay. that year. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and what about the sort of the interpretation and the the evaluation from what you'd found? How long did that take? Um, so we Sam and I spent um, we sort of were delayed in going through all of the notes, but we in the fall basically kind of set aside the time. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it took about three to four weeks to, to put it all together with obviously other projects on our plates as well, but um, uh -huh. you know, in terms of going through the interviews, pulling out um, themes. Okay. And I'll, I'll just add to that, that 
because we conducted the interviews internally, we were able to take some of the findings and takeaways immediately after the conversation and think about it, you know, in real time. Um, so, you know, the synthesis happened a little bit later. As Rebecca said, we were a little bit delayed, but we were using this and talking about it uh, immediately after the interviews were concluded. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's helpful to know. Thank you. Um, one of our questions, and um, it comes from um, Israel, is, uh, and something I mentioned about the, one of the slides you shared, um, Sarah, about the indicators. You know, can you share a little bit more about some of the indicators used to measure leadership sustainability? Anything? Oh, sure. Um, you know, and then I'm, I'm wondering if it might be helpful to um, Sarah Beth, maybe even to, to share the slide of some of the indicators. Um, I'd be curious to hear from Rebecca and Sam how, how they might have adjusted um, during the course of interviews as they thought about leadership. Um, but the um, when we talk about the strong and stable leadership, the three indicators that we had identified um, was that the ecosystem had a core and sustained group of both lay and professional champions for teen education and engagement who occupy influential communal positions. So already there's a lot of really big words in there. Um, the sustained group um, is something that's really powerful as you think about um, how much transition there often is in the professional space. Um, so really having a group of committed lay leaders is really, really important um, to this work. Um, and the influential communal positions, we really wanted to diversify um, who we were thinking about as we talked about leadership. And so not necessarily only sitting at a federation or only sitting um, at one potential partner organization, but are they sprinkled throughout at, because we are looking at the ecosystem. Uh, the second was community leadership effectively articulates a coherent vision of teen education and engagement for various constituencies and stakeholders parents, teens, and educators and engagers. What we find is all of this work is so interconnected. Uh, teens sort of don't appear fully formed in high school. Um, and there is a whole network of uh, parents and caregivers who also really influence um, a lot of their decision-making around um, how they might spend their time and connect with the Jewish community. Um, and the third was the ecosystem has both the quantity and quality of professionals necessary to execute its stated goals. So um, while one of the domains is solely focused on youth professionals, as is one of our measures, it felt very important to elevate the fact that there should be both the quantity and quality of professionals in the leadership piece. Um, Part of our work across the field is really trying to elevate the role of youth professionals um, and really think about career trajectories and ways we might better support them. Um, and so it was a very profound statement for us to elevate um, the youth professional piece under the leadership indicators. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Sam, Rebecca, is there anything else you wanna add about what, what potentially maybe you found or any other piece around that leadership that you maybe wanna to add to that? I, mean, I can speak to what what we found during our, our implementation. Um, what the the main um, piece that we found was that we have we have a core group of of um, professional leadership and and committed lay leadership, and that there's work to do to to grow that and to make sure that we have diversity in terms of representation um, on different community boards and. Um, different platforms where we can ensure there are champions and advocates for teen education and engagement. But we're not starting from nothing. We have a, a core group. An earlier question in one of the pieces that we talked about um, was that this was a diagnostic tool versus a survey. But one of the questions we have had through the chat is, you know, had had there or would you consider using an anonymous survey aligned to the same indicators instead of or maybe even in addition to the qualitative interviews? I, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll speak um, on behalf of sort of, um, you know, the, the macro funder collaborative and, you know, one of the things that really um, helps define our work is how much flexibility there is within the, the broader funder collaborative for the communities to really prioritize their own work. So I, I will let Forefront chime in as well. Um, the powerful thing about this tool is that it's a community conversation. And so Sam really um, 
made this point earlier on, um, that the tool in some ways is an intervention itself. Quite often um, we're engaged in work that is really meant to be about stakeholder engagement um, without really engaging the stakeholders. And what we found about this tool is that whether you're having focus groups or individual interviews or whatever types of conversations you're having with professionals, lay leaders, partners, professionals, it really is designed to be expansive for who you uh, could engage in this conversation. Um, the goal is the flow of information. And one of the things that we've also really found is it's a, a, an amazing opportunity to educate some of these folks around um, sort of the broader nature of the work that might be happening when they might only see a sliver of it. So um, making it an anonymous survey really takes away from um, what it's designed to do, which is to really hear from the community, reflect back what we are hearing and develop an action plan based on those findings. If I can just add to that, um, sure. something that we found in our conversations was that most people were not able to comment on all eight domains, just everyone kind of comes from their own um, perspective and their own experience, and they didn't necessarily have um, the context of, of being able to, to speak about all of the areas that we were probing around, which was fine because throughout the conversations, there were other people who could speak to to the ones that potentially, um, you know, one person wasn't able to. Um, but I think that would be a challenge with a, a survey as well, is just designing it in such a way that um, that it would, people would be able to um, make uh, reliable choices in terms of, of where the ecosystem um, was at in terms of the different domains. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to also add that, you know, the relationships that were strengthened through these conversations, um, would, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to have those conversations in real time had it been a survey. You know, there were ideas that were brainstormed on some of these things, and I had the opportunity to follow up um, and, and create more connections. And it was, I think that that was one of the biggest value adds um, to this, to doing this tool ourselves. Um, and that just wouldn't have happened had it been a survey. Thank you. Um, another question that's come through and I'm curious to hear is, you know, this is a diagnostic tool and from the associated point of view, you know, how, did, how has this influenced your understanding of the definition of sustainability? What have you taken from this uh, experience in terms of how you're now working with other organizations? I think it's definitely expanded our our definition of sustainability and um, how we're viewing, particularly for the, the teen initiative, the impact and the, the change that we want to see as a result of our funding investment in Forefront. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it speaks to the, the culture shift um, and the, the community prioritization in, in teens. Um, that goes beyond um, will we have the financial resources to sustain this initiative? Um, do we have the, uh, the leadership in place? Um, but as Sarah um, you know, spoke to previously, speaks to the larger question of, of what's the impact of this work and how do we ensure that that impact um, is, is, continues to um, have longevity? Great, thank you. Um, I am conscious of the time and I like to make sure that people um, are uh, available to go to their next meeting. So really in just the last few minutes, I would like to just ask each of you, just in terms of, you know, what is one takeaway that you can share with uh, the audience about the work that you have done? So maybe I'm gonna start with you, Sam. Great, thank you. Um, like I said, I think the biggest takeaway was the power of of these relationships um, and the power of you know asking people what they thought and really I think tapping people they really felt like we were putting an emphasis on on feedback and and um, prioritizing 
the the communal like voice and I think that that was a really important um, part of this process. Great, thank you. Um, Rebecca. I think, um, you know, I, I typically like to have a, um, a picture of what the outcome is going to be when I uh, start something. And uh, Sarah all along has said, there's no, you know, there's no template for what the final product of this is. And I think that that was empowering in a lot of ways. Um, it was challenging, um, but it allowed us to really adapt and make it our own and make it useful and meaningful for our community. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I would just say, you know, it was just really come up in a lot of the questions is the adaptability of these tools. We are also big believers in surveys. We have our team parent and youth professional surveys that are freely available. So please do contact me if those might be useful for your organization or community. Um, those also roll up into what we call our cross-community evaluation. Um, and those reports are also available um, so that you get a snapshot. What I would say um, is very similar to what um, Sam and Rebecca sort of said about the conversations and the value that they've been having. Um, and I would say we're in a unique moment where we can really think about putting some of these incredible learnings into action. And so my biggest takeaway with all of this work is really um, what will we do with it? And so going back to the community and sharing an action plan, really sort of uh, reflecting on uh, you know, your work and priorities and using um, tools as really just a launch pad for some of that more reflective uh, and iterative work that we know is really critical um, in this ever-changing world. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. You know, I think you you sort of hit it right there. I think the ability for us to have thoughtful and smart and uh, if effective tools for us to understand the work is really valuable. And then also about the, what do we do with that information? What is the next phase of implementation and ensuring that we support communities really to thrive and do the best work that we can, whether it's in the teen community or uh, with seniors or any other uh, parts of uh, the Jewish community that we all work in. Um, so I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank you, Rebecca, uh, Sam and Sarah uh, for working with us uh, on this webinar uh, with JFN and granted, uh, thank you for inviting me from Honeycomb to speak. It is really a pleasure to work with such incredible women um, in the field and I feel very grateful that I get the chance to be able to do this. So thank you to many of you who've been on the call and I'll pass it to Tamar to take us home. Tamar. Great. Thank you so much, Wayne. Thank you for moderating and thank you, Rebecca and Sam and Sarah for your for sharing. Um, this tool and sharing your experience, um, really very helpful. Want to also say thank um, Sarah Bathke in the from Upstart and my partner and Granted, um, who's in the background right now. But thank you for bringing us all together. Wanted to let all of you know two things. One is that we will be sending out a recording um, of this webinar and the PowerPoint and the tool in the next few days, once we get the recording available and edited for you to watch again or to share with colleagues. And I also wanted to make sure you save the date for our next granted webinar, which will be on Thursday, March 10th, and will be on participatory grant making. We have a guidebook that JFN is working on as we speak, getting um, edited and finished up. So it'll be really um, new and right off the presses or whatever that expression is. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to do that on March 10th between 12 and 1 Eastern time. We will send in that same email with all these tools, we will send um, a registration link for that. So please save the date. And we look forward to continuing learning with all of you in the future. Thanks again and have a good day, everybody.